Rock and roll, eh? Talking about the rock rolling in, eh? That was a dad joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> Started wrong right there, you know? <laughs> that was rough, isn't it? It's okay, but we'll fix it in a minute. I think he's, he's more than mighty to cover my, my need and my, my frail father house kind of style heart and jokes. <laughs> Are you ready? You want something from God, you want nothing. If you don't want anything from God, this is the wrong place. McDonald's and Wendy's are open. You know, they will feed your gut. But if you want your soul to be fed, this is the place. Do you want something from God? Yes. Is there anyone in the house that wants something from God? Yes. I don't hear you. Let's remind the enemy that he has lost all, all those strings that he tried to pull us with through the week. You know, let's remind the enemy who's the boss. Do you want anything from your God in this day, today? Are you with me? Okay, today, out of the bat, yesterday's patterns, today's prisons. And we go into the book of Luke. Are you with me? I want us to stand up really quick. You know, we, we stood up in the train, in the bus. We stood up to read messages during the week in the sidewalk that were meaningless for the end of the week. We just did all those things, and sometimes we forget to stand for the... The really important things. If you're with me and you can stand, please stand. Luke 7 in the screen says, we're going to go to verse uh, 18, 23, if I, is that possible? And this is Jesus talking um, with the disciples of John the Bast a Baptist, right? And he says, John's disciples told him about all these things. And John called two of them. John received news of what's happening with Jesus. And he called two of his guys and said, hey, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus, he didn't lose time. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases. So he put them in a pause. He cured many that had diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits. And gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers after he lives it, he talks about it. That's something that Christians are still warming up to nowadays. He says, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised. And uh, good news is proclaimed. Is, is. That's a turn. Is. We could preach about that is only is proclaimed to the poor. Who's the good news? Jesus is proclaimed. Wow. We could stay there and have the worship team back in a second. Wow. I, I, it stopped me. It made me cry. So I'm, you know, I'm just going to stop it for a second so you just kind of wonder where my brain is going. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on mine. On the account of me, he's still saying he's the truth. He's awesome. He's the good news. Father, thank you for your presence, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would do, you would do what you do. You have nothing. But if you do it, we'll get so much more. And the world will know that you are our God. And that without you, there's nothing. In Jesus' name. You may be seated, get comfortable. What a day, what a sun, what a warmth. First of all, next Sunday we have a barbecue and someone said, Amen. it is the, the, probably the, one of the last community barbecues that we're going to have for the month. Um, there's going to be vegan stuff available for those that uh, still are living pre-Genesis. Uh, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, you can sue my agent if you find him. <laughs> um, 
And also, we got to say that it's not only that. Next Sunday, we're going to have the last Sunday that we're going to be in presence and before the end of the, the, of the month. Because the last Sunday of the month, we're going to be in Carnival. And um, that, that means we're going to be... Someone said amen. Yeah. Oh, let's go and represent the church on the streets. You know, the church was not meant to be a building. The church was meant to be people that carry truth and light and the seeds of glory that Jesus Christ, he said that he had planted before the, the beginning of earth. You know, the people that were walking the steps of glory and the ordained steps of God that were planted on each one of our souls before we knew what the name that our parents gave us. See, that's the church. So we are having a barbecue. And then we're going to have a time in the streets. And we're going to have a barbecue in the name of the Lord in the streets. And that means we're going to go amongst the barbecues. <laughs> Jamaican herbs and spices and the jerk chickens and goats, you know, of the Lord. To actually share of a better news than the jerk. <laughs> we're talking about Jesus, you know. We're going to go to the carnival. We're going to be preaching the gospel. And if you find yourself available, if you had time to come to church, you had time to come to carnival. Don't become carnal in carnival. That's, that's a different thing. But we are there to be that salt, that light. Church is not supposed to be this only. It's supposed to be an expression of Christ outside in the streets, in the midst of the days and the livelihoods of people, financially, emotionally, and spiritually. Are you with me? So that's the church. So that's the next two Sundays. I became very, very pastoral, very quick, and uh, very organized. And, and some people are very amazed about that. And I'll probably receive some very um, hypocritical messages, you know, of how proud they are of me <laughs> later. But now that we had that out of the way, let's talk about yesterday's patterns and how they become today's prisons. Are you with me? John is a man... That is actually Jesus' cousins. We all have a dodgy cousin, isn't it? <laughs> Someone said really quick, yeah, I have one, mate. We are, I'm praying for him, <laughs> for her. We all have a cousin that always talks too much. And John is that cousin for all of us, really. John is the guy that came over with a very prophetic anointing from the Holy Spirit where no one knew what that meant before. And he was called wild, and he was called crazy, and he was called to be this guy that is like a reed, like a very flimsy stick in the middle of the desert. That means you're fragile. And that's John. John was the son of a man called Zachariah. He was actually called, and theologians would debate today until most of them will come to, to the idea that he is maybe the last great priest supreme priest so john is coming out of the household with a lot of baggage you know when your parents are telling you and your parents are so busy doing things the right way it could be in the way that you tie your shoes in the way you cook if your dad is golden ramsey you don't use cumin just loosely in the kitchen you don't say apple crumble cumin you know you know you don't do that because you have a culture you have a background. See, you come from a pedigree. John came from a pedigree of priests and high priests, but God called him to be a prophet. Oof, that's, that's game right there. See, prophets were wild. Prophets would get in your face. Prophets would come and say, Oi, what about that hat, mate? Please turn off your phone. Can we have that in the screen, no? <laughs> you see what I mean? They will get into your personal space. Not only physically like this, because we're in family. And, and, and this setup is very intimate, you know? But back in the day, a prophet will come into the chambers of the king, and no one will come into there. If they will come in there, they will be killed. So John was a man that had a lot of work with all. He was brave. He was convinced, convicted, completely saturated of the truth. He was not playing church on a Sunday. He was not being, you know, kind of one of those that comes on a Sunday because it's good, I'll take it off, and I'll feel bad tomorrow if I need to, but today I have to do the good thing. No, John was a man of one piece. All of us need a cousin 
or friend that is in one piece? Yes or no? One that you know is the same Sunday and a Monday. Yes or no? That you know what he's going to order at the bar, at least in McDonald's. That you know, you don't have to ask him. You will pay and you can pay because you know what they like, what they do, what they consume in their intimacy. You know who they are. John was that guy for Jesus. And John was also his cousin. He was related to Jesus. You see, John was the son of Zachariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was actually a relative of Jesus and Aaron, the priest, the high priest, Aaron. So this guy, Zachariah, married another high priest because he comes in the blood, baby. When your grandma has been dodgy, you'll be, be a little bit dodgy, you know. But when your grandma has got fearing, the conversations around the table will lead you to feel the same God that grandma feared. You see, it sticks to you. Because it's a pattern. Ah, I got you there. We're landing. Don't worry about it. We're going to get good at this. See, John is following the pattern of a priest, but he's called to be a prophet. See, there's a little twist into that. A priest has to have a lot of liturgy. And that's not bad. And we don't understand. I'm just, you know. And I hope you don't think that I'm, I'm mocking. I'm just saying that's how it sounds. But beyond that, what is really important is not the humming, it's the heart. It's not the smoke. We got a smoke machine. They had incense back in the day. Today we mix them. But the meaning is the same. It's the praises. It's the prayer that go up. Technology without revelation means special effects. What if we had more revelation? And if you finish this, if you don't listen to anything else, what is still a special effect in your life? And it's not revelation. You can go home now. Bathrooms are for free. There's biscuits in the back. But there's more if you want. If you're hungry, you know, we're going to get more. So this is the pattern that John has visited all through his life. See, all these things that we do, how we pray. I mean, we have heard everyone, you know, before we start praying, we heard someone else pray. Have you seen someone that doesn't know how to pray? You know why is that? Because they never hurt someone. Have you seen a person that cannot talk, but they have also problems with the ears? It's not that their mouth is wrong. It's that they don't hear. So sometimes we don't know how to say things because we don't hear properly. And John is a guy that hears God. While his dad was a man that did things for God. And there's a bit of a division. There's different roles for it. And God is in the midst of a change of terms. The cavaliers, the horses are changing. There's a change of guards. And I believe we're standing prophetically in a change of guards today. We are a generation, we are a church around the world that is hungry for the miracles, but more than anything, hungry for his presence. We are a generation like Moses, that we can lead so many, so many out. But we are standing still in the gap because we have to know that he's coming with us. Are you with me? Are you part of that generation? You don't want to live the miracles only by yourself. You don't want God to take you out of your slavery and your Egypt. You want God to be with you. Are you with me? So this is what John is like. And he's in the midst of this turmoil, but he got caught he is actually in the midst of a kingdom that has overtaken the Jewish people and he told the king what not to do. And that, although it's his nature and his calling, like you today, maybe in the streets, you had a rough time this week with a conversation with your workmate, with your family mate, with your other cousin because you have the good cousin and you have the dodgy cousin, you know what I mean? And maybe you said to someone, oh, pff, oh, that's wrong. And they said, why? Who are you to say that? John caught himself in the midst of it. And because of that, he got into jail. And I know in each one of us, there's a struggle today. In each one of us today, there's patterns that are from our yesterday. 
And there are situations that we're fighting with our today, with our flesh, with our situations, you know, with a lack of character, or at least with the lack of manifestation of who he is through me and through you. Are you with me? And if we're honest, we'll be able to grab this not only as a good word from God, but we will take application because God wants us to bring in the bread, not leave it outside of the tent. He will provide it, but we were supposed to go out of the tent and grab it. The Bible said that when they were in Egypt, in the, in the desert, manna will come and rain over them, but they needed to go out of the tent and bring it in. Today, God wants us to bring the word in. So John is in, in prison. And he was a big mouth, like you in the streets, you know, like you say, things about Jesus to everyone, everywhere you go. You are that crazy one that goes into the supermarkets and says, you know, I know you and I know you by name and I might know, but Jesus says that to you. You're that weird client next to the other one that is very reserved and very conserved and is having a coupon in his mouth. You know, you're saying, I, I, I just want to trash, you know, rubbish bags. But Jesus has a person like you and a, pe a person like John in history for a reason. So John is there and he has talked of the truth and what is a virtue, what is good in John got him in trouble. And God is also asking us as a generation of Christians to have that spirit of God that was in John rest in us. The truth of God will get us into trouble. That's not sexy, but it's accurate. The reality of it is that if you are playing yourself for Christ, you're going to get in trouble. If you're marked with the blood, you're definitely going to get in trouble because the reality, the truth of God is despised amongst those that worship their feelings, their selves, and everything that is going. That is accurate in history, and that is accurate today. A lot of people say that this is old school. I say, mate, kiss the new school on. This is coming more alive today than it was for many generations, maybe. If we read it right, we will have the power of God among us and in, in us. Our character is going to change. Not going to be modified. It's going to be changed because the truth of God changes us. Doesn't modify us. Doesn't make us comfortable. It changes us. Because once we were sons of wrath, we were enemies of God. But when we said, Jesus, I need you, we became sons and daughters of the living God. And his power, his spirit rests in us. And John knows that. But he got into prison. And I mean, I'm sorry. I'm going to give just a little Christian addendum. Bear with me. I'm going to vent. Man, I, I wish to know how would I live that moment if I was John? And maybe I can ask you that same question. How would you survive that moment if you were in that position that the truth got you in trouble and you, you're about to be killed? See, this is what happened. There's a king that did the naughty thing with someone else's wife. And the prophet said, Opa. And he said it to his face. And in that moment, the king could say, you live or you die. And it was as quick as this. It's not Boris that he's just still fixing his hair. He's in Greece right now, but the second, second vacations in two weeks, my God bless us with our taxes. God bless us. Thank God. <laughs> Jesus is our king. Um, see, that was not like today. We're talking about back in the day, they were, you were dead. And because of that, he got into prison. And because the daughter of the lady that he was calling out in that sin, as for his head, he was about to be beheaded. But he had lived his whole life for God. He was Jesus' cousin, mate. And you know how you are. If you know someone can get you out of trouble, you call for that person. And don't fake it, bro. Don't fake it, girl. Because if you know someone has the money in your family and you got 200, 2,000, some of you 200,000, <laughs> underneath, you will call someone and say, I know he and she has the money. See, this is John. Because he knew the currency of life is called eternity. And he knew who Jesus was. 
but he was in a weak moment because he still is living on patterns. The patterns that were an example for him, that they were given to him from birth. He was born from an example. Some of us actually think examples are only the things that we learn and see. See, I have a dog. Whatever she sees, she does. But we are more than that. I can, I can talk about that. You know what I mean? I have kids. There are things that my kids have not seen me do and they, they start doing. And I say, what in the world was that? That was awesome. How did they learn that? And you ask them and you say, well, um, I don't know. We all have patterns. Patterns that are written. If you don't believe me, we could go into the scriptures. You have Isaac that lied about being the husband of his wife in a moment in life that he was in trouble. But you know who did that before him? His father, Abraham, the father of the faith. But the funny thing is that he did it before Isaac could have notion. So there's a pattern. And there are things in our life that are multiplied from season to season, generation to generation, that we struggle with, that sometimes we don't have an answer. But God is the word, is the answer. On time and in season, and out of season, even when we're out of time. Some of us have been in seasons and in moments that we said, this is it, I'm dying. But Jesus said, even out of season, out of time, Baby, I'm out to rock your world because I am your rock and I'm on the word. And I say when you leave, because I was there when you came in, I order your steps. So John is still there, but he's looking at all these things with the pattern. See, the problem is the pattern. The pattern is what, what you know what? I'm going to just go Greeky on you. Pattern actually comes from a Greek word that is called pater and the Latin as well. Pater, where we get paternity, Zachariah. So John is struggling with something that he got from his dad. It's like the COVID two years ago, 220. We're trying to think about it very far away, you know. <laughs> we're making a mess that we can, you know. One day people are going to see this video and it's like, they were talking about agesly, ages things, you know. Hey, two years ago we didn't know what to expect in our prisons, sorry, in our houses. We didn't know what to expect about diseases and things that we had. You know, that lack of knowledge. We didn't know what to do and what to say because it could cost us our heads. We could be there. We could be those that have seen the beautiful life that God has given us, but still are fighting with something that could be. Are you the one? You can call your friends and say, you got the COVID? John had the COVID. Ah, oh, I heard that Mario. <laughs> this is an Italian name, you know. But we don't know. And see, sometimes, I don't know if COVID came as a new thing or it's just a mimic of what we live every day. Because we live in those, those same prisons and cells day in and day out. It's just patterns. Around the world, we saw how the patterns were repeated everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter what climate you had. And I know I'm Puerto Rican, baby. I mean, the land of God. But the sun does great things for your vitamin D there. So flu is not a great deal. So when you have someone from a cold country talking to you about you shouldn't expose yourself to the sun because you may be... You say, I mean, that person doesn't remember the taste of salt and water at the same time. I have to say that there's a pattern in my life. And we are all receptive of them and susceptible to ones that are going around us. What are the patterns of your friends? Your brother, your sister, your dog, your wife, your, your husband for the sake of it. What are the patterns that we are looking at because those patterns inform us and they're going to raise questions. But in the life of John, the problem was 
that they will question God. What patterns in our lives are questioning God? What areas in your life are saying, God, you maybe got it wrong. Maybe all this teaching, maybe the Bible needs to be redone because nowadays you don't know God. What are the patterns of this world? What are the patterns that are around us that try to inform the truth of only one, the one and living God? What are those things that we have in our ears, in our commercials, in our buses, in our trains, in our own little, little hearts? Because we're all tempted from the oral concupiscence, by Paul said. And if we're honest, what are the patterns that have kept us inside of a prison for years? John, the biggest mouth in the Bible probably. Not even Jesus talked to the Pharisees like he did. He said, you guys, you got a brew of vipers. If I said that to you guys, you will walk out. Because you like the sugar-coated, ah, welcome to Hope and Anchor. But if today someone would ask you why you are a viper, you would like go, oh, oh, I think he was onto something, mate. I don't know what's going on with Chris today. He was a bit too violent. Because we don't understand the times. But I asked us, why did John, a man that had walked completely outside of the line, what we would say out of line, he was completely given in to the gospel. He was still being visited by the patterns in that prison. Maybe the prison for John was not the physical. Because John spent most of his life in the desert. Have you been in the desert? Man, there's nothing to go and see like a prison. There's nothing. You look up, you look down. That's it. The rest is sand and sky. There's nothing. And in prison, at least you have rats. John is in this moment. After he... He talked about the glory of God, like maybe you did, having doubts. And I'm taking a second to build this so it hits you personally. Because I think sometimes we brush it, no, that's someone else. See, we give that responsibility of conviction to someone else. No, 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 that's for my brother. That's for my sister. He's that, that's the other cousin, you know what I mean? Oh, that guy came in, that guy came in, that's for that guy. No, that's for me. That's for you. Sometimes we don't know. We're in prisons in our own life and we're asking Jesus if he's the one that really is the one that is going to make us free. John was preaching about this king that was coming, this Messiah that was coming and storming in with power and authority. And he depicted it in several ways that Jesus didn't actually follow because Jesus will not follow us. We have to follow him. That's the real gospel because he is the good news. He doesn't talk about them. He is the good news. So we are there seeing a John that is fragile today, that his Zacharias patterns are coming in. Why Zachariah? Why are you talking so bad about this dude's father? Let's go. In Luke 1, it says, you know, really quick. And I'll give you a little bit of context. You know what? In the, in the years of King Herod, you know, in Judea, you know, um, this, this father of Zechariah formed part of a division of priests on Abadiah. And I could give you all the meanings of that, but for the sake of time, you got to go and read your Bible. Okay, there you go. <laughs> That's in verse 5. Go and slap it in and just do your math during the week. But the gist of it is actually that he was old and his wife Elizabeth and him had a promise from God. Why? Because an angel of God came and talked to them. Sometimes God talks to you things in the private that you try to, to ask people in the public to say, yeah, I agree, but that's not for them. And maybe sometimes you have frustrated ideas that God had brought to you because you're looking for the acceptance of others into what God said, but hey, God is up to something. 
And when God wants to change the direction of a city, of a nation, God is up to something. And he will do things that people don't like. He will interrupt the system for the sake of the gospel and the generations that are coming. It's not going to look pretty, baby. It's going to look like Jesus. Because when Jesus was about to die, he didn't look pretty. He was not recognizable in the cross. We make him look sad on that cross. But the Bible says, your Bible, my Bible says that he was not recognizable. That the entrails were actually hanging out from his back. And we want to live a Christianity that is so light that we want to feel good when God rebukes us. But we forget about the Christ that died for us. It is not about those images that we have a flimsy, very skinny one. It is about the one that died. That was this figure beyond. There was nothing desirable in him, but we want to be desired as Christians. See, the enemy has gone into our culture so strongly that as Christians, we want to proclaim that we have Christ, but we also want to be absorbed and loved by it. But you have an anointing inside of your life that rebukes kings, police, and prime ministers all in one week with the respect and the love because Christ lives in you. He came to set us free. Free from the superfice, the superfluo. What is actually sufficing in itself is superficial, that is skimming over the surface. We have a gospel that is available for us John proclaimed it, and Jesus was it. Let's go to Zechariah really quick. Zechariah, by the way, actually means remember Yah. Yah is Yahweh. Yah, remember God. So this, my, this man's name actually means remember me. <laughs> God ordered his name to be remember me. You know, whenever you're there, remember me. What's your name? I remember God. The guy that remembers God. I mean, what's up, John? Imagine John. Just like it, and in your head, it means remember God. Every time someone would say your name, imagine that in your brain, it will bounce off the situation. And, and you would really have to come to peace with saying, am I remembering God? <laughs> you know, the guy that remembers God said this about that person. Okay, we're not going to get into that one. Because <laughs> I know that doesn't happen in this place. Don't worry about it. <laughs> or he doesn't believe God can do. The guy that remembers God doesn't believe God can do that. Or the guy that remembers God is complaining about that thing. Man, it would suck to be called Zachariah in that sense. Sorry, Zach. <laughs> we love you, man. <laughs> Just saying. So he is too old. And because he's looking at his pattern, and I'm not going to go into Zachariah's dad because we have enough dads in the room. Zachariah comes with that pattern inside that he has multiplied into John, but talking about Zachariah, it means that when God shows up in his life, he says, you cannot do that. How the heck is going to happen? I'm too old. And we have moments like that every day, day in and day out, areas that God says, you're going to stop being like this or God says you're gonna start doing that and you say how the heck my family will kill me my cousin is gonna tell me off they're gonna say or if we're really honest I don't know who I am if I'm not doing that if we're really honest are we gonna go deep should I go deeper a little bit, it's just not too much, just a little bit, two inches down, ready, <laughs> you're almost there, yeah, don't worry about it, the shovel is ready. <sighs> so, Zechariah, the name means the one that remembers God, also the last great priest, he was the one that actually represented an institution that was broken and dead, that had religion and rituals, but no power. There was no headaches going out of the door. There was no deliverance. There was no generosity. That's even stronger than a headache. When someone is generous, it has moving a lot more power than someone that has lost a headache, mate. I'd rather have a broken leg and be generous 
than the other side. Today, we appreciate the things that form in our eyes and we can explain. But what about what has to do with character? And that's generosity. When we come into the room and places transform, that was Jesus. John came against the ones that were creeping on the atmosphere. But Jesus came to establish in the atmosphere, the kingdom of heaven has come. See, this is the moment. The pattern is being transferred. I'm too old. I cannot do that. And the angel that came to say, you're going to have a son. But I'm too old. We heard that before. God always waits to, it's impossible for us to do it. That you have tried and you have never been able to change. You see that sin that you and your family has always have a struggle with? It is the time for change because you have proven to be completely inept for it. Welcome to the kingdom of God. When 5,000 plus kids and families are hungry, five bread and two loaves is impossible. You feed them, but we don't have enough. Uh huh. See, this is the beauty of this. And it goes in the book, day in and day out, if you pay attention. He was putting his possibilities in front of what is revelation. The priest, imagine the people. If you lose the north, how can you go to the streets? Only if you have conviction. We have people in the Bible that were completely convicted by God, but didn't love the people. You know, you're a bit hateful with the people. You judge the people in Argos, day in and day out, in Sainsbury's, you know, while you're driving. I do that. You know, I mean, we're all together in the same boat. You know, when you're like, ah, and you, you lack love for people. Who has lacked love for someone this week at some point? Come on, there's some people that have their wings. Show your wings or put your hand up, you know what I mean? Because the reality of life is that we are in the same and we have patterns that limit the revelation with our circumstances. So the old gave birth to the new. The liturgy to the prophecy. What is the law? to what is redemption. What is dead, to what will bring salvation and life and resurrection. This is the story. And today we go to the points. So John, context, John and Jesus, cousins, you know, the big Macanas. And you know what, they got problems. John is in problems, Jesus has problems because he's the cousin. And Jesus is actually minding his own business and doing what the kingdom is. But you know what? You don't keep on doing your business when someone else is having problems. Jesus still replied, he had time. You have time for people. Stop saying, I'm too busy. Shut up. Your ego is too small. Go and talk with people. First point. Second, for the ones that are taking notes. <laughs> Jesus creates such a stir that John receives a report by his guys, his mates. We all of us have at least two guys, one person that you trust. They go and gossip about how good things are going for Jesus. But John is still in prison. He was the one that was observed like the guy that is moving the town. And now Jesus is taking that place. And John had said already, I mean, I must decrease and he must increase already but the disciples are usually the last ones to get the memo it happened to Jesus and it happened to John and it happens to me and it will happen to you because we get used to ideas we get used to patterns so Jesus is explaining the pattern he's creating a pattern they're taking it to John John is asking them go to Jesus and ask because at this point I have talked and I have said, and I have opened my mouth so big that I said that he was going to come and he was the Messiah. 
that I didn't have the authority to untie his shoe. I baptized him when he asked me to, and I knew he was the Messiah. But he asked, he needed to fulfill the law. Am I wrong? Go and ask him. Jesus, did you say I was going to change in that area of my life? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Is my parents are going to get saved? Is that crazy cousin is going to come to the Lord? Am I wrong? And we don't come with questions because we don't observe ourselves as family. We rather have the liturgy instead of the disagreement. But Jesus heard the question and he demonstrated an answer. I love when God says, God, are you going to provide? And then all of a sudden, kikling, Barclays says something. Kikling, NatWest says something. Kikling, Bank of America says something. Kikling. Yeah, I provide you. He acts. He defeats the doubt with actions before he answers to your brain. Because his relationship is not what you can understand because if, a, if it was like that, some of us are less intelligent than others. I mean, look at me. I'm not that intelligent. And if it because of IQ, I mean, I was not the guy to be standing saying this. But with God, it has to do with faith, with relationship, with nearness, with understanding his character, how he brews it. So Jesus fed their spirit with information instead of just words. And after he fed them with truth and action that would actually penetrate to their memory, the one that remembers God. He's coming against the spirit and the prison that sent them there to doubt in his face. Be careful that when you talk to people, you don't send them to doubt on God the same way you've been doubting. You can express your testimony, but your testimony is still a very fraction, a small version of who Christ is in the overall. Be fearful of God. Explain the gospel in the beauty that he is more than enough and you cannot explain him. But if you allow him in your life, he's going to do more than enough. That's the only thing we need to do. That's the gospel. That's the Christ more than enough. That's the good news. So we got that. And we got the guy that is losing the pattern while he's questioning God. But we also have a guy in John that is finishing his race. Jesus has said that he came to deliver the people from prisons, you know, to give sight to the blind, to heal the sick. But with John, he didn't take him out of prison. Maybe Jesus was talking about different prisons, not physical prisons. Today we worship what we can understand but maybe God wants us to be enlarged in our understanding, in the well, to allow him to drill deeper. Every now and then, when you go to countries that don't have the, the, the sewer system that we have, they have to drill for water. And when the water on that river, subterranean river, is done, they have to drill again. In this season, God is drilling in you again. God wants to go deeper. More minerals, different waters, refreshing waters. The more it goes down, the fresher it is for you. You want fresh waters from God? You want the new of God? Go deeper. And John, in the midst of a prison that keeps his body, he's defeating at the end of his race, a prison that was in his mind and in his heart. Can I take two more minutes of your time? Yeah? Is it good for you? Is it blessing you? Yeah? Do you want more? Is it okay? Just two seconds, you know? I'm probably lying, but it's probably five minutes, really. 
He's finishing the race. And Jesus starts talking about him. This was happened. Jesus says to the people that came with a doubt and returned with certainty to John. John never asked another question. Sometimes the people that came for that report will never come back. But maybe you have to be cautious. Whose report you're listening to? Are they talking about what Jesus is doing in your life? About the hope that catched up to you? Or are they talking about the things that you should do to survive? To be someone in life? Because the book is full of stories. People that say, let me just go back and kiss my mom and my dad goodbye. And Jesus would say things like, well, let the dead kiss the dead goodbye. It was talking about death in spirit. And I know it's not popular today because people that don't know you will write on your Facebook when you're dead. And they never wrote to you while you were alive. This is the times that we're living. But today we have a God that wants to stir a deeper world. A world that is going deeper with him. Is getting fresher wars. That the patterns that limit us and generations before are getting done with by a God that is walking with us and is healing our sicknesses, our needs, our blindness. The things that we could not hear, that generations never heard from God, He's giving us hearing back. We're not deaf anymore. We are the ones that God is asking to open your eyes and tell me, what do you see? But we have to go back to the waters. Jesus is saying, hey, you know what? Even what it was dead in you, I'm raising it back to life. I don't know what you had to put to death. Maybe it was a relationship. It was actually had to do with your family. It maybe was a dream. Maybe it was a company. Maybe it had to do with something that you could do with your gift. Maybe it was the way that you thought of yourself. You said, I will always be like this until I see Jesus. And you, you made it very Christian, you know? But maybe God is in this place today. Just say, hey, you don't have to go and finish your race with the same doubts that your dad gave you. As we close and we have the worship team back, some of us, are still carrying the voice of that Zachariah inside of us. We're still judging areas in our lives that we say, how is it going to happen now? If it has not happened still, how is it going to happen now? See, that's, that was not John's doubt. That was his, his father's. There was a struggle of doubt in the lineage. The priest had given birth to the prophet. The priest with the doubt gave birth to a prophet with doubts. And as a church, are we multiplying doubts or are we multiplying the glory? Are we multiplying the is, the good news? Who one is? I am the one that is, Jesus said. Why are we multiplying? I know sometimes we want a sugar coated, very short word, but I think sometimes we got to go back to the dungeon and kiss goodbye some skeletons. We have to go back and say, hey, I can be real today in the presence of God. He doesn't need my Sunday best. He needs my heart. He wants my heart. He wants those voices of religion, of old, of impossibles to succumb in front of who he is as my savior, as the one that ransomed my soul, the one that wants me, that doesn't put up with me. God doesn't put up with you. And that's for someone in this room. I'll say that again. God does not put up with you. So today, 
I think God has been dealing with some. I believe that the Holy Spirit is trying to show us the way out. But we have to accept what has been in. So if you join me in your feet, that would be great. Jesus said that he didn't want us to stumble. He didn't want us to, to suffer from the good news that he is in our lives. But not suffer in our flesh. He said, I don't want that my freedom causes more pain. That's why he came and died for each one of us. It will never grow old. It will apply to every story, to every day, to every moment. He said, I don't want you to stumble. I will go to the cross. I don't have personally the details what has happened in your life, but I'm certain that all of us have voices in the past, have patterns. Some of those patterns have attempted to make us crazy or lustful or to value things like money and possessions more than they should be valued. But in this place, there's a God that puts everything in order in the room of our hearts. Jesus says, I don't make you stumble. I make you free. Jesus came for that last person in John to be defeated. He said, tell him that what he knew about me is happening. He can rest. The doubt died before John was beheaded. Before this season is done in your life, the doubts in this season are going to die. But you have to have the right report. As believers, we have been given the choice and the right by Christ to listen to the report of heaven that what is lame in us is blind and is deceased and is dead will come to life and will be restored. But it's up to us. And we have to become a good report through the doors into our streets. That's what we're born for. This is who we are. We're the feet and the hands of Jesus. Next couple of weeks, we're going to go heavy on our streets. Sidewalks are going to know glory. There's some pieces of sidewalk that never knew they will become famous in the hearts of some because in that place, Jesus met them. But it's going to happen in your city under your watch, in front of your eyes, and maybe even with you touching that life. What is the report that that person is going to get? Someone in front of them is going to be in a prison? Well, that person is going to be asking for the right report. Is that person going to be here, hearing how you're in doubts after doing so many things for God? Or are you going to go in the power of the gospel that saved you, even that you know you didn't deserve it. Like we all don't. What is it going to be? Today we choose. Today we stand. John, even in his jail cell, about to be beheaded, he took a stand. He asked a question to the right source. Are we asking God to the right source the question? We ask him friends. We ask him family. Are we asking the governments to give us what only God can give us? Are we giving financial aids the place that only God can suffice? What are we going to do?